welcome. Uh, before we begin, uh, we are pleased to announce the first question of the day winner, Casey Olin uh, from Denmark Group, who was selected as the winner for yesterday's session. Uh, we will contact you about your prize. So uh, students and the postdocs, please uh, keep asking great questions. And if you ask a, a question in person, please introduce yourself first. Uh, okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker today, Dr. Uh, Kun Han Cho, who will join us virtually. Uh, Dr. Cho is an assistant professor of computer science at New York University. Uh, Dr. Cho, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, share your screen. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Just share the screen. Okay, uh, yeah, so please feel free to start. All right, uh, well, thanks for the invitation and then it's a great workshop. Let me see. All right, there you go, yes. Uh, well, so I thought, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, Deep Manifold Sampler, which is one of the kind of found uh, technology behind the precision design, which is the startup that started last year, January, 2021, and was uh, rapidly acquired by Genentech Roche. And you know, the, by talking about this deep manifold sampler, you know, I, I hope you know, I'll be able to tell you about two distinct angles that must be taken together or combined in order to do a, let's say, a better job at the molecular design. And you know, here we're, I'm going to focus a bit on the large molecule protein design. So the, just to give you a sense of what precision design is, because you know, the, this one was there for about a year, uh, half a year before it was acquired by Roche. So it. Precision design was founded based on the collaboration that was that went on for about three to four years between Rich Bonov, Vlad uh, Gligorievich, and I at NYU, and then you had to be founded the company with the goal of trying to do a computational protein design using a generative modeling rather than the discriminative modeling, and then we started to hire some awesome people such as the Andrew Watkins from Stanford back then, Daniel Berenberg, and Stephen Ra. And then you know, in August 2021, uh, we got acquired fully by Genentech and we became a precision design team within Genentech and we are called a first Genentech accelerator. We focus on antibody design and by December uh, last year, we were able to deliver the first batch of proof of concept protein designs. And we, uh, we are growing at the moment in three different locations. Main location is New York City. The second one is the South San Francisco, where the headquarter of the Genentech is, and then the third one is Switzerland. And we're growing, so if you're interested in, let's say, next career moves, just do reach out to me. So that said, uh, there are two aspects or the two angles to the foundations behind our technology, what we often refer to as deep manifold sampler. And then the first angle or the aspect is a generative modeling. So I'm going to talk a bit about generative modeling. In a broad sense, not uh, that is not really specific to protein modeling. So when we think about generative modeling, which often uh, we refer to as either unsupervised or the self-supervised learning, we are just given a set, a very large set of unlabeled examples, and we have two tightly related goals. One is to score, so that is, we're trying to estimate an energy function such that the energy function, uh, energy function assigns a lower energy to an observation that was seen during training, or that is very very similar to the ones that were seen during training. And the energy function assigns a very high energy to an examples that just do not look at all like the unlabeled examples that were seen during training. Now, the second goal is sampling. That is, we try to learn a distribution over all possible sequences or the examples, and then uh, such that the probabilities assigned to the input or the X that is similar to the training examples is higher than the others. Now, why are they tightly related? Because we can always turn an energy function into a probability, probability P of X by using Boltzmann distribution or the Boltzmann formulation. And in particular, in the case of, let's say, protein design or molecular design, we are working in a discrete and finite space, so we can almost always turn the energy function into the distribution. Now, of course, this, this doesn't imply that we can readily sample from this distribution, and I'm going to talk about that a bit uh, shortly. Now, what this means is that the, uh, we often run into all those different types of the sophisticated looking neural networks that were designed to do generative modeling, but there's really nothing special. All we need to do is to build a neural net that is going to take us the input, some one uh, point in the input space, so X, and then output a single scalar. And then the scalar can be any value in any real value. 
And what that means is that the, all those that say complicated looking neural nets that we've looked into, they, at, the, uh, you know, at, the, at their core is a very simple function. It's a scalar function that takes as input a vector input and then outputs a single scalar. And we can train this model to maximize the log likelihood of data or the log likelihood of the parameters, depending on what kind of a C perspective you want to take. Now, interesting thing about this uh, log likelihood function that is often written down as the sum of the log probability assigned to each and every data points in the training set. If you look at this one, then we see that there are two terms. The first term is the energy that is assigned or the negative energy that is assigned to the actual observation. And then the second term is the log sum except of the energy assigned to all possible values in the input space. Now, as usual with any kind of neural net these days, we, we often train this kind of, let's say, energy function or the neural net that does the generative modeling with a stochastic gradient descent. And when we look at the gradient of this uh, loss function, in particular looking at an individual example, what we end up looking at is that we again have the two terms. The first term is the one that says that we need to decrease the energy value assigned to the true observation, so the observation that comes out of our training set. And then the second term is one that tells us that it, or tells our model that the, we need to increase the energy assigned to X prime, so that is not the input from the training set, but that is very highly likely or the highly probable under the current model. So what we do is that we always go back and forth between trying to lower the energy of what we have seen while trying to increase the energy of the points that already have lower energy according to our model. And eventually, it's going to converge the point that the model is going to assign only the en low energy to the examples that are very, very similar to a training set. So that the first term that is trying to lower the energy of the training set, and then the second term that tries to increase the energy of the likely or the probable points cancel with each other. And then that's how we actually do the generative modeling. And this is pretty much universal for all the approaches that you have seen so far. In fact, that includes the more modern, let's say, score-based diffusion models and whatnot. Now, what does that mean is that the, once we train this model, we actually can use this energy function in order to identify a low-dimensional data manifold. Now, if you think about it, if you simply imagine, let's say, all possible ways in which uh, the input can be configured. So if you think about protein, then you can imagine that, okay, here's a primary structure. There is a sequence of amino acids. And then you're going to imagine sampling each and every amino acid from some uniform distribution. And then what you get is that the most of those samples are not going to be anything that is interesting nor realistic. In fact, the proteins that are realistic and meaningful and functional are in fact going to be a extremely small, tiny fraction of all possible ways in which we can put the amino acid together to form a protein. And what that means is that the, the interesting data, true data often lies in an extremely low dimensional manifold of the entire space. Of course, you know, when we think about this discrete data, it's a bit difficult to imagine what it means for data to lie in the low dimensional data manifold. But in that case, you can imagine that the subset of the input space over, well, subset of the all possible input uh, input set uh, is uh, over which the true data uh, is included is so much smaller than the original one. Now, what that means is that the sampling from this kind of generative model is our way of sampling from this low dimensional data manifold. And it turned out, in fact, given any energy function, EX, that somehow, somehow was trained, there are many different ways to sample from the according, uh, the, let's say, you know, the corresponding distribution. We can use, for instance, Gibbs sampling, we can use Metropolis Hastings, we can use Langevin dynamics if the input space is continuous and the energy function is differentiable with respect to the input, or we can even train some kind of generative adversarial network with the energy function as a fixed discriminator. So all these things are possible. Unfortunately, none of these works really well when X input is a discrete and combinatorial. And that is precisely where we are actually working at. The molecules are in fact a discrete combinatorial, uh, the instantiations of the discrete combinatorial variables and a lot of the interesting problems that we solve like the language generation and so on, all belong to this category. And then none of these sampling algorithms that are agnostic to data works well. And unfortunate thing is 
if we cannot sample from the energy function or the distribution constructed from the energy function, we cannot actually learn this energy function uh, either. Now, you know, the, we can always get let's say, a bit blinded by the fact that there are new, fancy, more sophisticated generative models uh, every year, but all of them requires us that the, we have to be able to do inference or the sampling well enough to learn very well. Now, they can show up in the form of, let's say, sampling requiring a lot of computation or that just comes from the, uh, that may come from the fact that the sampling, sampler simply rejects all the new samples, but it really doesn't matter. We have to be able to sample from this energy function really, really well in order to learn this energy function well. But then of course, if we cannot learn it well, then sampling from this energy function doesn't really mean much. So why is it so difficult? And then why is it a universal problem behind any kind of generative modeling. There is no essentially you know, degenerative model that can avoid this issue. The reason is precisely because the data lies on a low dimensional manifold. Now that's supposed to be a very good thing because we know that the data or the intrinsic dimensionality of the things that uh, of data that we need to model is lower than the original, let's say, uh, ambient dim dimension. But it turned out for generative modeling, that's a horrible news. Because if you remember from the SGD or the gradient of the energy function, the first term was trying to lower the energy on the, uh, along the low dimensional data manifold. But the second term becomes problematic because the second term tells us that the, we have to increase the energy in everywhere else. So we need to increase the energy, energy assigned to everywhere else to be really, really high. And then what that means is that the, in high dimensional space, we have to consider this exponentially growing volume of the space in order to get this generative model working well. But then, you know, we start wondering, you know, what if we do not actually care about the entire space? Do we really care about all possible ways in which let's say, amino acid can be put, to, put next to each other? Perhaps not. In fact, what we really care about is that the, if we start from the po from a point on the manifold already, all we want to know is how to change this point in order to move to the adjacent point on this low dimensional manifold. And then we just continue to do so until we are satisfied, you know, by uh, consuming our computational budget or having some kind of, let's say, stopping criteria that is satisfied. And then we collect all those points and then call them a set of samples drawn from this manifold. Perhaps that's enough. Perhaps we don't really care about sampling any points or the trying out points that are off the manifold. And of course, there, there are, again, two closely related questions. There are all, always two questions. One is how do we figure out a valid direction? So how do we actually change the input at each point, each time step in order to ensure that the next point is indeed an adjacent point on the data manifold? And then, of course, we cannot have the deterministic function like for that, right? It has to be a sample. So these two are very related. And then it turned out a good answer is denoising. And then denoising can be written down in just one formula that you're seeing on the screen. That is, we're going to start from a one point in the training set, which is by definition on this low dimensional data manifold. And then we're going to corrupt it. So we're going to kick it off the manifold and then we train a neural net to push it back onto the manifold as well as it can. And then that is the idea of denoising and it turned out that denoising is the way for us to identify this manifold by knowing how to change the, any point on this manifold so that the change point will stay on the manifold. Now, how does it do that? It, it turned out it's very simple mechanism. If the corruption kicks the point off the manifold, then denoising is, by definition, trying to push it back onto the manifold. So by doing this denoising, the model learns what is the direction that pushes the point off the manifold. Now, if the random, let's say, corruption turned out to keep the data on the manifold or this corrupted version on the manifold because of the ambiguity, that is, there will be many different training sets that can map to this corrupted version on the manifold, the model won't be able to actually say that this is the direction that needs to be suppressed. And then this 
non-suppression, non-suppression of particular directions is how we actually get this delta, the change that keeps the point on the manifold. Now, there are a few important properties because these are the questions that I always get when I talk about the denoising as a way to identify this kind of data manifold. First thing is that when we design this corruption function, this corruption function must be unstructured, meaning that it must try as many, if not all possible directions of change or the corruption in order for learning to figure out both valid and invalid directions. And this is very different from data augmentation. So the data augmentation is a way for us to make a change along the data manifold. On the other hand, this corruption function must be able to push the point of the data manifold as well. And then second thing is, once we train this kind of denoising over encoder for the sampling, we have to ensure that the when we use it, the sampling must start near the manifold already. Because of the corruption, it's going to be somewhat robust to where we start as long as we start near the manifold. But as we move away, further and further away from the manifold, we're going to find a lot of spurious modes. And then this comes from the fact that we don't care about the entire space. If we cared about the entire space, then learning would have actually suppressed these superior modes. So there are the points that look like the data manifold that is very, very off the data manifold. But we simply say that, the, well, we can always start from somewhere that is sufficiently close to data manifold. And that is based on the domain knowledge or you know, the expert, expert knowledge in the target domain. Now, finally, the important thing to just notice here is that the when I talk about the adjacent or the neighboring point on the data, uh, data manifold, that actually doesn't reflect necessarily the, our perceived similarity in the input space. So we're not talking about the edit distance effectively. So the jump that we can make can be much greater than just making one insertion, one deletion, or the one replacement, but we can actually add, delete, and replace multiple residues or the multiple dimensions at the same time. And then this is a reason why at Precision Design, we use this denoising autoencoder that we have designed for the sequences as a foundation. So that was a discriminant uh, generative modeling. Now let's go to the second angle of our uh, second foundations of our technology that is discriminative modeling. Of course, this is the one that we all think uh, we are very familiar with, and then indeed most of us are very familiar with it. And it's just a classification problem. Now the discriminative modeling is just classification. We're trying to model the distribution of the label or the output space given some input and often the output space is much lower dimension than the input space which makes it uh, makes it easier problem to solve than the usual generative modeling and this is used you know everywhere and then in fact the reason why you know we are probably talking a lot about the deep learning and neural networks uh, already from yesterday today and tomorrow is because of its success in various domains and then of course this success has already permitted into uh, you know the molecular design as well and then you know these classifiers can be trained really well and then they can be used to rule out a lot of the let's say unnecessary or the undesirable uh, candidates along this pipeline of this discovery, molecular discovery. Uh, one interesting thing is that the, if you have a classifier, the classifier also defines an energy function. That is, if we have a p probability of some class Y given X, then we can use that probability value itself to turn that into an energy function so that we can define a distribution over the input, just like what, we ha what I have shown earlier. Now, we need a bit of a regularization, R of X, but I'm going to talk about that. But essentially what we are saying is that if you train a classifier, you can always generate from it, given any particular target class, by, class, class or a target value in the case of the regression. It's pretty nice. And it was I did, uh, noticed already quite some time ago, like 2010, 2011, and all, uh, in 2014, Karen Simoyan, who was back then at Oxford, showed that the, we can actually get a pretty interesting looking samples drawn from this energy function that is implicitly defined by a deep convolutional network. These are some of the examples. Now, they don't look that good, but if you see really, really carefully, you're going to see that the, you do, uh, you're going to see some of those patterns that make sense. So for instance, when you look at the bell pepper, the leftmost one, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a, some of the features of those peppers in that image, but of course it doesn't look too well. Now that has been pushed forward for the next two years since 2014. And then this was from, let's say, more 
Mort Vincent, uh, L2015, uh, who were back then at Google, if I recall correctly, who showed that the, if we design this regularizer R carefully to reflect the image statistics, then we can get a much more realistic looking images. Now, of course, they do not look realistic at all. I mean, but you know, you see a much more, uh, let's say, much better features of each of the classes from this kind of visualization. If you look at the banana, the second, second, uh, the second one from the left, you do see some of the bananas. But of course, this kind of visualization is a nice way to see that the, our classifiers are not perfect at all. Because if you look at the parachute example. It actually shows a person, it looks at a person. What that means is that the, it's not only just looking at a parachute and it also looks at whether there's a person who is using parachute to coming down from the sky. And that is not what we wanted to do. But anyway, what this means is that the, yes, a classifier defines an energy function from which we can draw all these samples, but also that the classifier alone is not enough. But then that's because in this high dimensional space that we're working in, there are just too many holes that are going to be induced from this kind of classifier. So this is a really nice uh, illustration from the Yosinski or 2015, where the top parts corresponds to the images that look like images. And then the, as we come down further and further, there is po uh, points in the space, this very high dimensional image space where the things just do not look at all like images. However, our discriminative model is going to put a boundary and then saying that the leftmost part, let's say a third, is going to be the blue class energy, where the energy is really, really low there for the blue light images. And then the center third for the red, and then the right third for the green. And then looking at this, you can actually now characterize all those different types of the adverse, uh, uh, different types of the samples we can draw from a classifier based energy function. We get all those adversarial examples. If we get examples that are at the top, but are slightly close to the decision boundary. We get all those crazy looking examples that are going to fool our classifier to classify this random looking thing into various classes. And those are the ones that are on the at the uh, bottom half of this image. So what that means is that we really need to use a generative model that we train that energy function that I talked about at the first half of half of the talk in order to constrain the sampling from this kind of discriminative classifier to stay near the data manifold. That is, if we had an energy function that was already trained, we can actually ensure that the, whatever the samples we draw from the discriminator is going to, or the classifier is going to stay at the top half of this whole thing. Now, if X work continues, which is a case where everything is so beautiful and easy to handle, such as an images or the, let's say, audio signal or time series, then in fact, already from 2017, we knew what to do about it. That is to combine an image classifier together with a denoising order encoder, which has been shown to approximate the score. That is that the gradient of the log probability of the input. And then we can combine these two in order to ensure that the whatever we sample from the image classifier does not deviate away from the data manifold too much. And in fact, this Ngo NL 2017 was pretty, pretty, uh, let's say, dramatic in a sense that they were able to tell us that the how the images that uh, uh, how the images should look like for each of the class that were so real that sometimes people had a difficult time distinguishing between the true image and the generated image. And then the, what you're seeing on the screen are all the generated images. If you look at the ends, except for the fact that the, this classifier doesn't really get the sense of the number of the legs each of the ends should have, but it does look like an And monastery, that one is just beautiful. So only if we can use it for discrete X. And that's where we get into this dim manifold sampler. And then dim manifold sampler is our effort at combining the generative model and discriminative modeling together for the purpose of protein design or the sequence generation, uh, sequence design. So there were three desiderata that we try our best to satisfy when building this deep manifold sampler. The first one was that the sampling has to be iterative. What do I mean by that? In order to draw one sample, we cannot really just have one shot generation. We want it to be iteratively refined to be a good sample. And then why is it important? Because this allows us to incorporate external oracles to guide sampling. And also this allows us to control the degree of exploration as well. And second one was 
the fact that uh, second one was that length must evolve during sampling. When we look at many of the existing approaches, such as the uh, directed evolution, as well as the rational design using Rosetta or whatnot, we often never actually change the length that dramatically. But from from where I'm from, it is natural language processing machine translation, length has to change. That's like the kind of a say default mindset. So we wanted to ensure that the borrowing some of the techniques from natural language processing machine translation, we wanted to ensure that the distinct manifold sampler is able to change the length of the sequence in this process of iterative sampling. And furthermore, by doing so, we can actually uh, solve some of the non-trivial problems, such as the say compression of the proteins and whatnot. Oh, we haven't tried it, but you know, strictly saying, we we could try it in principle. And then the third one is that the diversity must be pr prioritized, because at the end of the day, real biology, real chemistry, real phys real physics do not live inside our computers, but they are actually out there in the real biology farms, you know, the human bodies and whatnot. So what it means is that the, we cannot really rely on our models, computational models to get us the very best design without interacting with the world. So we wanted to interact with the world. And what that means is that the, we have to take into account that the fact that the, these models will make mistakes. Now, what that means is we don't want a single best solution. We want to look at a diverse set of possible solutions according to our model so that we can run experiments. So the first ingredient in building this deep manifold sampler is a sequence denoising autoencoder. And in doing so, we added in three different, um, let's say, flavor to the original sequence denoising autoencoder from Hill et al. 2016. So we ensure that we use multi-vector representation. We ensure that we can transform the length and we ensure that the decoding is not as autoregressive as usual in order to maximize the diversity and then also to admit residual or the individual, let's say, token level control. The second ingredient is a function predictor on top of this denoising autoencoder, the denoising sequence denoising autoencoder. So why do we actually want to put it on top of that is because if we be very, very naive and simply say that, well, we are going to iterative sample from this denoising autoencoder. And every time we get a sample, we're going to score it with our discriminator or the function predictor. And then using the score in order to do a rejection or the acceptance according to the metropolis Hastings rule, we know that this is not going to be enough because we have to explicitly try multiple directions in order to know what is the right direction to move. So instead, what we want to do is that we want to get the better, better way or the much more efficient way to compute the direction toward which we change our sample. And then how we are going to do that is to do that in the intermediate continuous hidden representation of the denoising autoencoder. So in this denoising autoencoder, the, after the first part, the encoder is done, we're going to get a hidden vector representation. So we get a set of them. That representation goes into this function predictor, the discriminator. And then from the discriminator, we can now compute the gradient of the score assigned to the desirable function back uh, with respect to the original representation. And then we can just you know, kick the representation just a bit so that the, whatever we decode out, whatever the decoder is going to decode out is going to have a higher chance of exhibiting, exhib exhibiting that particular desired function. And then this is exactly how it looks like our model. I mean, I didn't have time, so I just drew it on my tablet. So we start from the original sequence. We're going to corrupt it with some unstructured corruption. We're going to replace some of the ridges. We're going to remove some of the ridges. We're going to add some random ridges. This corrupted sequence goes into transformer encoder. And at the end of the encoder, uh, at the end of the encoder, we're going to have a length predictor or the length difference predictor that's going to try to predict the difference in the length that was induced by the corruption function. And then that allows us to transform the length to the original length or to transform the sequences. So we'll do the either the up or down scaling to uh, get the length correct. And then that goes into a transformer decoder. And then we try to train the whole thing, transformer encoder, length transformator, predictor and decoder to minimize the reconstruction error with the denoising error. While we put a separate function predictor on top of the hidden representation, which allows us to now back propagate the error from the function predictor all the way to the, trans, uh, uh, the end of the encoder so that we can now guide or the, uh, guide the sa whole sampling procedure at every time step. And then you had the as a proof of concept before you know we got acquired by Genentech, we trained the deep manifold sampler on the PFAM, so 20 million un unlabeled sequences and this uh, uh, half a million annotated sequences from Uniprod. Uh, 
and then you know, we wanted to see how it works. So first thing is that we just sample for, without any guidance, and then what we see is that the energy level, which was estimated using Rosetta, uh, you know, more or less stay at the same level, or sometimes goes down, sometimes goes up, but it stays at the same level, meaning that the if we start from a point on the manifold, it does in this stay on the manifold. There was a whole, let's say, idea of using denoising instead of trying to estimate the energy function explicitly. And then we just tried some, you know, the fun stuff, you know, the old computational fun stuff. So we started with this uh, meta binder, and then we removed some of the residues for which we know are critical for this meta binding property. So after removing those, let's say, red colored residues, it's not even, uh, probably not even well formed and then will, uh, won't fold although you know we can't really know for sure and then we're going to let this uh deep manifold sampler evolve this sequence while we ask the deep manifold sampler to try to increase the chance of this exhibiting the property that is going to bind to a uh, calcium ion and then after about only about six generations we do see that the those critical residues that we removed were introduced in another place and then also the fact that the length of the whole sequence has changed. When we tried to uh, fold it last year with the TR Rosera, so it was like before alpha fold two or the right before alpha fold two, we did see that you know it did look pretty uh, reasonable uh, to be a calcium ion binding. And then we could see a, uh, we had a few other, let's say proof of concept uh, experiments back then, now computational simulations largely. So, but now you know, we are using this technology to do the antibody design, and then we were able to send in two batches of design so far. And then, you know, we do see that this manifold sampler, of course, together with the many different oracles and the residual level or the uh, token level control, we can in indeed get the expressing uh, antibodies that do bind to a tar uh, to target uh, antigens. So um, I just wanted to uh, say that, okay, so in order to do a good, let's say, design, we have to ensure that we uh, tackle it from the both angles, generative modeling and discriminative modeling. Generative modeling narrows down the search space intelligently, while the discriminative modeling now guides us within this narrow down search space in an intelligent way. Now, of course, the manifold sampler is just a one effective and efficient way to do so, but there are many other uh, approaches that can be taken. And then you know, we believe it's just the beginning and then um, I already see from this workshop uh, that there are a lot of interesting th things that are happening. So the, what are the couple of the next steps before I uh, wrap up my talk is that the, we are working hard to try to figure out what is the right way to quantify the uncertainty in this kind of very high dimensional combinatorial space, because it actually helps us not only to maximize how well we can learn by, you know, the Explore, uh, by making a better balance between the exploitation and exploita uh, exploitation and exploration, but also it actually helps us gain trust in our own designs as well. Uh, the second thing that we believe are, is really important is a multi-objective sampling. So we, you probably have uh, heard about or have even used multi-objective optimization in order to find the Pareto frontier and whatnot, but those algorithms often are very much based on the black box optimization and they don't really work in a high dimensional space. What that means is that the, those algorithms can only be used when we narrow down the set of candidates to an extremely small set because that are, those algorithms don't scale. So what we want is to do a multi-objective sampling in the space of thousands, if not tens of thousands dimensions that is in the middle of this, uh, this dim manifold sampler or any kind of a neural net based generative models. We believe it's necessary for efficient and effective exploration. But unfortunately, uh, I actually don't know what is the right way to do this at the moment. Uh, but you know, I'll be happy to actually talk about it at some point uh, offline. Yes. Anyway, that actually does conclude my talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Cho, for the great talk. And anyone, if you have questions, you can come to the mic here in front. And uh, I think Slim will also moderate questions on Zoom. So yeah, we have uh, time for one or two quick questions. Yeah, just there. Hi, um, my name is Carl from Hung's uh, group. I gotta I guess I am looking at this. You're talking about manifolds a lot, but you didn't really talk too much about like um, maybe like designing or like, are there any specific say like types of manifolds that kind of, it would be good to enforce constraints to have. One thing I was thinking about was 
since you know you're working with like a discrete input that you're going to get perhaps multiple points on the manifold that correspond to the same generated output. And so you would probably want those to all fall within the same region as opposed to having different places on the manifold that end up corresponding to the same output. And like, mm -hmm. are there, do you have any thoughts on like constraints that would enforce things like that? Um, right, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Indeed, I did not talk too much about the what, what I even mean by manifold here, right? So you know, the, I, I'm actually not referring to this manifold from a strict, let's say, mathematical, let's say, matrix optimization type of view, but more like the manifold as in some kind of subspace of the input over which the data or the, you know, the, you know good looking data is concentrated. Now, if we have some domain knowledge, so for instance, in the, in the case of the computer vision, we know that the, uh, all those, uh, if, you, if I start from the realistic looking image, all those, let's say, rotated versions, as well as the inverted versions, or the, where the, let's say, the lighting condition changes, they all are also realistic looking. Then in that case, we can, in fact, try to impose those kind of, uh, impose the manifold to be equivariant to those changes. And then that can be done in many different ways. We can either introduce the data augmentation in order to implicitly encourage our model to capture the kind of manifold or the kind of equivariance properties. Or of course, we can also build a neural net itself to be equivariant to those changes that we know uh, the neural net should be equivariant to. Now, unfortunate thing is when it comes to these discrete sequences that are combinatorial sequences, we often have a very little uh, idea of strict equivariance or the invariance, except for in a very, very uh, limited cases. So what we do is to use denoising order encoder that uses as unstructured uh, corruption as possible you know, so that the neural net is going to automatically capture those invariances as well as the equivariances, but obviously they are not going to be perfect. So in that sense, the manifold that, so how to characterize the manifold that has been captured itself is a big question. And then that is connected to the AI explainability as well as the interpretability. And then that's quite critical because we want to ensure that the how our model or the denoising order encoder is capturing manifold agrees well with the underlying physics as well as chemistry. But so the, uh, yeah, it was a very uh, long uninformative answer, but the answer is that the, the characterization of the manifold itself is a research uh, direction that needs to be taken. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it uh, seems very interesting. Thanks. Um, thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, any other questions? Um, so I, I noticed you were looking at autoencoders, and of course you mentioned a lot of um, maybe more recent generative models. Uh, I was curious what, what your thoughts were on like um, combining mm -hmm. normal. Sorry, sorry. Right. Uh, I was gonna say like, like your thoughts on combining normalizing flows with um, mm -hmm. this sort of discriminative modeling. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, in fact, the, uh, if I want to be a bit, let's say, relaxed about the strict, let's say, -ness of our conversation, then most of these generative models almost always end up being autoencoder. So for instance, in the case of the, uh, you know, normalizing flow, you know, like you can imagine that the inversion of the flow function, either, either direction, can be thought of as a decoder or encoder of the other. And then what we're trying to do is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping that brings me from the original data points using the inverse of the flow, go back to the, let's say, lesson space, and then use the forward flow to come back, and then ensuring that the I can actually uh, come back exactly without losing any information. Now, in the case of the, those diffusion models, it's quite similar in a sense that the, we start from the unstructured, let's say, noise, now we're trying to go through all this diffusion process, and then what we're trying to do, or the reverse diffusion process, depending on how you actually view it, now what you want is that you want to be able to come back. So that is, we start from the original image, we're going to go through the diffusion process, go to the unstructured noise space, and then we follow the reverse diffusion so that we can actually come back to it. And then that's actually, that makes sense in a sense that the, the whole process of generative modeling is to ensure that the, if I start from any point in this Latin space, I should be able to always end up on the data manifold in the input space. And to do that, I need to try to see where I end up. And then if I end up in the off manifold uh, point, I'm just bring it back to the on manifold point. And then that's where the idea of this, this you know, the, the positive phase and negative phase 
being universal across all those generative models. Now, of course, depending on the domain and the problem and the input data we are working with, some approaches are going to be more suitable than the others. So for instance, if you're working with the images or the audio, then these diffusion-based models are amazing because diffusion-based models do rely a bit on the these infinitesimal changes and the, how they actually affect what we uh, what it looks like. Now, and then that actually gives us a huge power in what needs to be done and then how the parameter needs to be changed because we can compute the gradient effectively. However, diffusion-based models cannot really easily be applied to this combinatorial discrete space because we don't really know what what even diffusion is, right? Yes. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I guess. Oh, I sorry. Uh, due to the time limit, I may need to move on. Email me. Yes. I, just, I, mean, I, I, say I asked David Baker a question yesterday, and he mentioned they were using diffusion models on their proteins. So I thought that was interesting. Oh. Right, right. They might actually use, uh, use it for the confirmation, getting confirmation or the coordinates. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. And thank you, Carl, for the questions. And if you have more questions, I think 